Good morning, everyone. It's Wednesday, June 3rd. Welcome to Change the Shed. If you haven't been here before, uh, we are here to do some tapestry weaving and um, hopefully support each other in that pursuit. So I hope that you are um, getting some weaving in here and there. I um, brought this piece back, I actually worked on it some, and um, it relates to the events of this week and last week in the United States after the killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis. And I don't think that I can do any live event this week without mentioning something about it. Um, so just briefly, because I'm not the one who should be talking. Um, I just wanna say that there's a lot of pain in the country and there should be. Um, if you can only do one thing right now, um, if you're a white person and I am talking to those of you who are white mostly. Um, please listen. I recommend, um, this is what I've been doing the last couple days, this book. There are many others. Um, find a list that was put out by a person of color and start with one of them. This one is really great. Um, and then listen and listen some more. And then as a country, we have to address our systemic, I did not think I would cry, um, our problems with systemic racism because this country was founded on racism and has to change. So let's weave, and this piece actually has to do with that because I have um, woven the word listen into it and um, actually enjoyed the weaving a lot. Um, Tapestry is a good way to spend some time uh, calming down and um, just being in the moment. So that might be helpful. I'm happy to see that you all are here um, and from Texas and from all over, from Canada and Texas and Washington and Janice, it's fine if you drink your coffee first. Um, some of you are having lunch because it is um, noon on the East Coast and some of you are across the pond and it is evening and some of you are in Australia and it's the middle of the night. So I appreciate all of you who are watching live or who show up later. Um, <clears throat> Dinah asked if I'm liking the sketchbook school course I'm taking. I do. I'm taking the Procreate class right now, Dinah, and um, it's excellent. I'd like to take another um, of their classes just about drawing. The Procreate class is about how to use Procreate, but they're um, the setup of sketchbook school is wonderful. And actually they do free um, online sketching things like every weekday, I think. Uh, three of them are on Instagram and two are on Facebook, I'm pretty sure. So look up sketchbook school if you use those platforms and you can get a feel for um, the people who um, do some of the teaching. They're really fantastic. Um, Michigan and welcome. Um, yeah, it's been a week, you all. Um, and I think we can't skip over that. So thanks for humoring me, I guess. Um, oh, good. Michelle got a tabletop easel for her hook it. That, um, yeah, there's... Uh, great ways to hold smaller looms, especially if you have ergonomic issues. Um, but we all have ergonomic issues, right? We have bodies and um, 
they don't work well in certain configurations and everybody's is different. So you have to play around and find what works best for you. Um, so, um, gosh, y'all are here from everywhere and Yes, that's the next one on my list. Marina says she's reading How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram um, X. Kendi. Uh, that one is actually uh, the next on my list after I read this, which I am two thirds of the way done. It's excellent. Um, you all are sweet. Thank you. Um, okay, so let's... Do some weaving. I agree, McKenna, that voting is so important. I was actually going to weave the word vote in here, and then I decided that you have to listen first. So I decided I'm listen, but I can tell you I'll be weaving vote soon. <laughs> um, Yes. Um, oh, Jennifer says this book is out of stock on Amazon. So that means everybody's been buying it. Um, I suspect you can get a Kindle um, edition of it. Oh, Barbara, good. She got her saffron and has already woven a piece. Um, oh, Marlena, that's great. Um, so if you all haven't seen, there's a lot of artists around the world, and especially in the UK, I think is where this started, that are um, selling smaller pieces for um, 200 pounds or less, which is, what is the pound now? That's got to be a little over $100 maybe, US. Um, and then when they sell 1,000 pounds worth of art, then they commit to buying a piece from another artist. So it's a really cool thing. Anyway. Um, Marlena was able to get one of Jilly Edwards. She's selling um, these beautiful little tapestries that she did. If, gosh, I showed one of them in one of the classes recently. Anyway, if I remember next week, I'll bring one down to show you, or I'll pop an image in the, uh, um, I'll put an image of one of them in the thing, just because they're really wonderful to see. Um, so, um, <clears throat> Jilly is um, posting a lot on Instagram. So go to Instagram and I think her ha hashtag is underscore Jilly, which is J-I-L-L-Y Edwards. Pretty sure there's an underscore before that. So, but if you search for Jilly Edwards, you'll find her. Um, she's just someone who's been inspiring me a lot lately just because I think her, wor her work is very abstract, but it's very full of life and uh, don't we all need that? Okay. So this little piece, this is the one I'm, you all have seen it multiple times if you've been on this thing. I am struggling like so much to keep the sides. Um, even they've gone out a little bit again here and they were narrow down at the beginning. And um, for whatever reason, this is a piece that is full of struggle and maybe that's appropriate. <laughs> Um, I did have a lot of fun weaving this word, though, so I will uh, keep going. The end of the piece is here. It's a fringeless four salvage warp, so I have room to put the end. Let's see if I can turn this sideways there. Maybe you can see the sort of wonky words, L-I-S-T-E, and I'll have room for the end and then a little bit more of this um, stuff that I did at the beginning. So that's the idea of um, of this piece. So it's not just you guys that struggle with weft tension. I it's a crutch for me on my um, Hairspell rug loom, which is right behind me. I get to use the beater on the loom a lot. And it's so easy to see whether you're drawing in on a loom with um, a beater like that. 
because the warps come through the reed and as soon as you bring that reed forward, even if you're not even beating the cloth, if you bring the reed forward, you can see what's happening with the uh, warps. So I get used to that and then I go to the smaller looms, especially on a narrow piece. It's so easy to um, vary the size. I've certainly gotten wider on this piece from the beginning, so I'm not gonna beat myself up about it, but it's fiber, it happens. I also had to do, I actually did, I, my thing about this piece was I was trying to make it um, without a cartoon, but when it came to the words, I had to actually sketch out how they were gonna look because um, I was feeling pretty lost. I still didn't use a cartoon, but I do have a little sketch to go from. A bunch of you say that you're finding the um, this book that's on the screen through um, your local library, so check it check it out. Um, I know my library has uh, Kindle books. Often there is a super long wait for some of the newer Kindle books or the ones that are in high demand, but your library might be different, so. My library only ends up with three or five copies of any particular book, even on if it's an ebook. So maybe your library is different, is what I'm thinking. Okay, I need to move this E. This is what I'm thinking. This needs to come up much more steeply. So I need to build a little hill here. Let's see if you can see if my camera will cooperate if I do this. So. I need to make this part of the N. So I need the E to come up. I need this line to get much more steep than it is doing right now. So I'll build the hill underneath and then I'll put the green on top of it. It's okay if you thought the leaf was a candle. <laughs> Morris, I'm not surprised. People thought that this one was lips, and I kind of like it actually, so it doesn't matter. It's just a, um, I started this piece, this is what I was going to say a minute ago, um, testing this particular yarn from Gist Yarn, and uh, now I've come to a point where I'm just weaving with it. Um, I like the yarn. I still like it. So I would like to dye some of it. I think I might have enough to dye some of it. So I may do that this weekend. Going to break out the dye pots because I have some other experimenting to do. Let's see. Oh, Sarah, see? Um, so this is, here's the tip from the master of narrow tapestries, um, guide strings. Thanks, Sarah. Um, I'll try it next time. So guide string is a string. So you would, um, tie, oh, you can't see my hands up there. You would tie, um, strings on the side that aren't woven and it, tell me if I'm wrong, Sarah, but, um, that gives you a visual for whether the warp is shifting or not. I think, um, especially on a loom that was uh, on a table, like I moved this around so much. Um, anyway, an upright loom on a table, especially would that would be an excellent. Um, it's an excellent visual, kind of like the reed on the floor loom. It's the same concept that it just can show you right away. Oh, Catherine, what did I just do with the end of my yarn? I just spliced it. So um, I just, uh, f basically it's feathering. So I had three ends of one and three ends of the other and I'm basically like, oh, I can't do it with my fingers. Overlapping them sequentially. Um, and then I will actually 
cut those splices off with this yarn, I will cut them off. It, what materials I'm using um, has a big impact on how I deal with the tails. Okay, actually, I don't like that. Or it's not the curve that I wanted. Yeah, and so Janet, that's what I was trying to say to Sarah's thing, but um, wasn't saying it very good. Janet says, um, just make sure the guide strings stay where they're supposed to stay. So what I was thinking was that it would be harder for me on this loom that I'm like throwing around the house and carrying outside and stuff for the guide strings to stay in place than if it was a loom that w was on feet on a table or on the floor. That's what I was trying to say. Um, or maybe on um, my LeClaire floor loom or something. Definitely guide strings could be used on a um, on the Harrisville also. Okay, that's better. So I'm looking at this step pattern. Is that focusing? There it goes. Um, looking at this step pattern, trying to figure out where I want it to go. Let's just look at it. That's better, but I don't see how that little piece is a little bit too big maybe. Let's try it without one less wrap. I think that will be better. Okay. And of course at some point I get too picky but there's a little fluff of weft there. Okay. Um, tape. Sarah says to keep the guide strings in place, use tape. This tape, I swear, if you don't use blue tape, especially if you're using pipe looms or fringeless tapestries or anything, this stuff is the best ever invented. It's, um, if you're in the U.S., it's called, um, it's blue painter's tape, and it, you find it in the painting section of a hardware store. And I think other countries call it something else, and I don't know if it's blue, but it's not as sticky. It's the stuff that you use if you're a painter to mask um, off a wall or window or something because it's not sticky enough to pull the paint off, but it will um, keep the paint from going under. Anyway, um, so Sarah says, yes, the guide strings are exactly like a read, a quick visual reference. Um, not that it necessarily keeps your salvages straight in any mechanical way. It just gives you a visual. Uh, sure. Oh, thank you, Nan. <laughs> um, yes, absolutely. I'm so sorry. This would be so much easier for you guys if I did this. I'm really sorry. Should have said it sooner. Um, there. Now can you see it? Especially if you're on a smaller device. Um, you should be able to see it much better now. Oh, Debbie asked if I ever use graph paper to plan words. I don't weave words very often, Debbie. Um, I have used graph paper, though. So, um, yeah, that's a definitely, it depends on what kind of words you're wanting. But I think the graph paper really probably helps you figure out, um, oh, come on, camera. I'm going to back it out just a little bit because I think it, let's see if that does better. Um, I think uh, the graph paper can help you realize how big the words have to be and keep them a consistent size. So, yeah, I think that's a great. Something that a lot of people use. Um, okay, let me just do one thing because y'all are probably, I'm going to turn the I turn the focus off so I can't change how close this is, but it should stop doing that thing where it's um, focusing in and out. Whoops, I forgot I had that on a bobbin. Okay, actually... Here... How do I want 
this to go. You know what? I'm going to make this a diagonal line that goes pretty much all the way up. This, sorry, I should have, this thing is sliding off the end of the table. I apologize. It keeps moving. I would say someday I'll have a professional video studio, but I never will, so. You'll just have to put up with inconsistencies, and I'll do my best. Okay, so I want the line to go like that, and then I want it to get steeper in this direction, so. I want this to go over here. Great. kind of play with what the angle will be. And so this is a 1-1 one, one angle, so I'm doing 1 over, 1 up every time. You can see that. Um, I like that, and I my idea is that this will go off the edge, and I'm going to put in an N right here. Of course, this could be done with a cartoon. Which makes the decisions easier, but again, I am attempting to stretch my brain. I went to a two over one, uh, two up one over. That is about the um, steepest angle that I can put this weft in eccentrically. So I'm gonna try it eccentric eccentrically and we'll see. We'll see if it works. This is a test run here. Otherwise I will do wraps like I did on this down here. I think it might work. Um, okay. Let's try it. Yeah, that's true, Janet. I have that all the time, too, where she says my edges look perfectly straight but turn out to be slightly diagonal. So measure the width every few inches. Um, I like the, the, you know, whatever that face is, the ghost face. Um, measure the width every few inches, which is so true. And um, I don't even have to measure this to know, but down here it was two and an eighth, and at the beginning it was actually exactly two, and now I'm up to uh, two and a quarter, <laughs> which is a fairly high percentage of spread for a narrow piece. Um, oh, this. This this is listed. Um, this is the Etsy Thread Through Time um, beater, and there's a link to that on the, uh, on the website right there, that link. 
Etsy, um, on Etsy, Threads Through Time is the shop. She makes beautiful, or her husband actually um, makes beautiful beaters. They also make um, Turkish spindles. Yeah, McKenna, um, I, I was, um, I learned that from Sarah actually to when I'm not using a cartoon to, to um, sort of draw it on the warp where I want it to go, which helps my head think, because now I'm thinking, okay, I need this little line to go down here for the N, and so where is that going to be? And um, it helps to see it visually with a little finger motion. So yes, um, I do that a lot. So now I'm going to notice that the sheds are wrong. So I needed this to be two passes and I don't really want it to be three. Um, although it could be, it would be more like this. Let's go with three and see how it looks. So the sheds are, are wrong for me to weave here because I didn't, um, just because of the way it worked out. If I bring this back up, they will be correct. Or I could have put in a thinner piece of weft. Or I could have switched the way this butterfly was interacting, or I could have added another butterfly. There are a lot of ways to. I think I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna take this lighter color. I don't want it to be quite so thick all the way to the edge, so here's a little trick. I just dropped half of the bundle. So the shed is still changing, but I am making the line thinner there, so it won't be quite as thick at the edge. Now it will weave. Sorry, I had that on a bobbin and <laughs> lost it. All right. Jocelyn, I'm a quarter inch off in width. So it was it's a quarter inch wider now than it was down here at the beginning. <laughs> this is um, okay with me at this point. I'm not gonna try to bring it back in um, too hard. I, I honestly, um, it doesn't really matter to me at this point, but on another piece, it would really matter to me. So I would have worked a lot harder. <laughs> would not have been so lazy. I would have worked a lot harder to keep it um, in line because I noticed way back here, um, way down farther that I was having issues with that. And of course, to do that, I would have made sure that my weft tension was not spreading. So pulling, um, you still have to bubble. It still has to go over and under, but you want less weft in there so that it pulls the warps back together. You can see my weft tension is even because the warp spacing is even, but gradually I've put too much weft in and it has spread the warps and made the whole piece get wider. So that's the trick is recognizing that things are getting wider even when your warp spacing looks great. Tapestry can be tricky like that. Ooh, I wanna put a little leaf up here. Oh, I should have put it on that side. Oh well. All right, so I think I need a little piece of uh, green color. So I'm shifting this. I don't know if you can see the color change, but down here it was a dark green and I'm shifting, it's a lighter green here, and I'm actually gonna try to shift it to blue and then uh, more of a turquoise color. But right now I still have, let's see, this was two light greens and a blue. This is some of that epic yarn that is um, 
variegated it threw me off for a while I was like wait did I choose the wrong color yarn it's so different this particular color is so different on its length that it looks much much darker in points so at some point I thought I was using the wrong color <laughs> thanks Jennifer that's sweet of you it's getting wider like an open heart or a listening ear I'm gonna go with that thanks Jennifer I feel much better about it now I don't actually feel bad about it. I think it's fine, but um, these pieces I call my tapestry diary and um, just because that keeps it in my head as being a, um, what is the word, uh, less formal practice. It's just a practice, like sketches in a sketchbook that are there and they are for learning and um, it's not necessarily something I need to really be too invested in perfection. I'm not going to enter this into a show or anything like that. I'm just doing it because I want to weave and I'm learning from it. Okay, so here is, that's going to be the stem of the N. And then we'll make the N go over and around. I don't think I want it quite that high. Yeah, I think I want to make it go up from right here. This is, oh, sorry, Debbie, I didn't mention that this is actually still that epic yarn, the EPIC. It's not Weaver's Bazaar. It is um, loose, more loosely spun than Weaver's Bazaar. It's similar in size to Weaver's Bazaar fine. It might be a little bit thicker but it is um, not Weaver's Bazaar. Yes, Laura, that's a good way to say it. If I had bubbled less, I would have been able to probably keep it um, to the original size. Um, and if I did it from here on out, I probably could get it to come back in a quarter inch by, by the end of the piece, which is still four inches away or so. But... Um, I guess that would be one option because the listen part would be wider and then the edge would be narrower again, but um, let's see if I can make it come in a little bit. My original intention was that this yarn be woven at uh, 10 ends per inch and I think it's now closer to eight. Okay, so now to make an N that goes up and around like this, I need to um, build up the little hill that goes under it. And that's actually how the shape is decided, not by the green part. In this case, the shape will be decided by this white that underlies it. That could be like a metaphor for something, right? The structure underneath. So yes, less bubbling, as Laura was asking. The, this problem I'm having with this also is that this yarn with three strands is sort of not, it's sort of on the edge of covering this at this set. So um, if I do less bubbling, that's another problem with getting it to cover. So there's multiple things happening there. But that's what I would do. You probably can't even tell the difference that I'm um, decreasing the amount of weft a little bit. And also, what warps will walk out. So, like when I come back here, trying to keep that a little bit firmer. And now I can even see it pulling in a little bit there. You can probably see that too. Um, so, an edge warp will walk out and the other warps will follow it along like little ducklings. So that is another way that your pieces can spread out. If you let the salvages, if your turns at the salvages aren't nice and firm, um, the edge warps can walk out and then the next warps follow along and you get a little duckling thing happening. 
We should name it that. There should be a, there should be a name for it. That or the Pied Piper of Hamelin. Um, yeah, Jennifer says she looks like the cursive might be more um, friendly than block letters. Maybe in terms of um, it's sort of free form. I didn't try to make this like I didn't look up a font and try to make it look like it was a consistent weaving. Um, block letters. Uh, yeah. Depends on what the black letters are, but yeah. Um, this is definitely more friendly than s sort of static block letters in terms of easier to weave because I don't care that much if it's not perfect. Um, oh, good. Thanks, Kate. So she's saying, I can tell what this yarn will look like in um, 8 and 10 EPI all in the same piece. So that is absolutely true. Um, it actually does, Carolyn, work better with three strands at, she said, does this yarn work better at three strands at 80 PI than 10? And I think yes, that for me, the way I weave and the warp that I'm using, um, eight EPI is a better set with this yarn than, than um, 10, but that could be different if you use a different, you're using a different warp or you have a different hand to your weaving. You can already see there that the warps here, let me put this in. The, just by tightening that edge a little bit, you can see that the warps on this edge are closer than they were just a minute ago. So um, I guess that's pretty good evidence that you can change your uh, warp spacing, weft tension pretty quickly. Okay, well, uh, the duckling effect. I like it, Janet. I'm going to go with it. It's the duckling effect that the warps walk, walk out and follow each other. Um, the, so that's another question Paula is asking. If you're using more green yarn for letters than for leaves, would that increase the width of the weft? So both the... All of the colored yarn in this is epic, and the white yarn is this um, yarn I was testing for just uh, yarn uh, for a new tapestry yarn. Uh, just it, it, it's on the website if you're interested in what I'm talking about. Um, so anytime you shift the amount of weft and they're different, that it will change. So yeah, definitely. Um, all of those things shifting all the time. If I'm changing the yarn that I'm using and stuff, it will change the amount that needs to go in there. So I think really what happened is I just wasn't paying attention, but it's okay. Anyway, by the time you see this again, it will say, listen, I might even be done with it. And so um, hopefully you all will listen also. And um, we should all listen to each other and try to make it a better world. The uh, edges are not doubled because this is a fringeless warp. So often you'll see on my other looms that I am putting two warps on the salvages, a doubled salvage warp because um, I use a pretty thin warp and I like that little bit extra firmness on the salvages. This is a fringeless warp. So every single one of these warps is doubled and I'm not doubling the salvage because that would actually make quite a thick um, salvage warp. So, and these warps are a little thicker because they're doubled. So I didn't really need it anyway. All right, you all, um, I will be back next week. Same time, same place on Wednesday. And we'll see, hopefully I will have, I'm sure I will have finished this and have some other project in the works. Maybe I'll even show you what I was dying this weekend. So um, that will be fun. I hope you all have a good week. It is becoming summer here in Fort Collins. Uh, it's supposed to be, it hasn't hit 90 yet, but it's supposed to be 90 on Friday. So um, yeah. There are days I wish that I had air conditioning. <laughs> anyway, um, 
enjoy your weaving. Please have a, a good week um, in terms of what you're making. Make stuff. I think it helps us breathe. And um, I will see you again um, next Wednesday. Same time, same place. Um, oh, yeah, Nan, I haven't forgotten. It's on my list. <laughs> you guys are worried because I, they are Ross Loom. Um, that is also on my list for the weekend. So I'm going to put it to, I have not even put it together. So I have finished a couple big projects and I have, I spent uh, yesterday laying in a hammock <laughs> because I needed a long nap um, and reading this book. But, um, Yes, the Aras Loom is on my put it together table, so I can, I will actually make a static video of that and put it up, but I'll let you know um, when I get that going. And maybe the next piece I have in mind, I'll put on that loom. That would be perfect. Then you can see it in action. Um, you're welcome. You guys are great. Thank you for um, being so great about everything and for showing up and for sharing. And I will... Um, be so happy to see you again next Wednesday. Um, in the meantime, happy weaving. <laughs>